Welcome everyone. This is Pinnacle Professional College. And today we will be going through um, management accounting. Um, today we'll be discussing modern costing systems. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so and hit the notification bell so that you can you know, receive lectures as soon as we post them. Okay, so let's dive into today's topics for discussion. There's a number of things we need to discuss today. So I'll break it into different, um, uh, different lectures and so that the knowledge or information won't be so overwhelming. So I'll separate it into different lectures so that it's easy to assimilate. So number one, under modern costing, costing systems, we will be looking at activity-based costing We'll be looking at target costing. We'll be looking at um, how to close the target cost gap. We'll be explaining the life cycle of a product. We'll be illustrating throughput, what we call throughput accounting. We'll be explaining the theory of constraints and explain the concept of bottleneck resources. What does bottleneck mean? and would we'll demonstrate strategic pricing decisions. So that's a summary of what we'll be covering today. So let's dive into it very quickly. Now let's talk about ABC or activity-based costing. Activity-based costing. So what is activity-based costing? It's simply a costing method, right? That assigns cost to activities and to products based on each product's use of activities. So as the name implies, or as the name suggests, we have what we call activity-based costing, right? So the co costing is based on activities. So it's driven by activities. That's essentially what it means. So it's basically a costing method that assigns costs to activities. It assigns costs to our activities. So assignment of costs is driven by activities or the product's use of activities, essentially. So what is the whole rationale behind activity-based costing? What is the rationale behind activity-based costing? Activity-based costing is based on the premise that products consume activities, right? So when an organization has a product, what that product consumes, is activities and we would explain what an activity means in the context of ABC as we go along. So product consumes activities. Now, before you see a finished product on the shelf, it has gone through a series of activities to make that possible, right? So if you see a bar of chocolate on the shelf, it most certainly means that it has gone through activities. It doesn't just come out of thin air. So that's what we mean by products consume activities or are driven by activities, if you want to put it that way. And number two, activities consume resources. Activities consume resources. Now, what does this also mean? We said that products consume activities, right? Um, but we know that these activities that essentially um, produce products, they are driven by resources. You cannot engage in activity without resources, right? So for example, if you want to produce, let's say, you know, let's say a bar of chocolate, you would need resources to do that. Yes, you would need activities, but the activities must be driven by resources. You would need resources as you do that. So, Important things to remember now, two important things. The rationale behind ABC is that one, products consume activities, and two, activities consume resources. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting chain from products to activities to resources. Numerous companies such as HP, Caterpillar, IBM have implemented activity-based costing. And it's not only them, a number of institutions or global companies have implemented activity-based costing. 
Now, what are the steps in activity-based costing? Now, we said that activity-based costing is a costing method that assigns costs to activities. Assigns costs to activities. So if you are thinking about steps, what would you think first? The first thing you need to identify and when it comes to ABC is you need to identify the activities that consume resources. Remember we said activity-based costing. So what, what will literally be the first thing to identify, you know, first thing to undertake is to identify the activities that consume resources and assign costs to those activities. So number one is identify activities. Identify the activities. So for example, an example, typical example we can give you is the purchase of materials, purchasing could be an activity that drives costs, All right? So when you, when you want to you know, produce, let's say, again, let me use my example of a bar of chocolate. You would need cocoa, right? And when you need cocoa, you need to go purchase it. Now, purchasing that material drives costs. Purchasing that material will drive costs. So purchasing materials could be an activity that drives costs. Purchasing materials could be an activity that drives costs. So that's, that's a typical example of identifying an activity that drives costs. So purchasing or purchasing materials is an activity that, you know, drives costs, you know, that drives costs. So number one is identify the activities that consume resources and assign costs to those activities. So after you have identified the activities, assign costs to them. Number two, you identify the cost drivers associated with each activity. Identify the cost drivers associated with each activity. Now, when we say a cost driver, what does it mean? It's simply anything that drives cost. So anything that causes a cost to be incurred, anything that creates a cost, anything that engenders a cost to be incurred, so after you've identified the activities, you identify the cost drivers. Now, purchasing material is an activity. We've all agreed on that in our first step. Purchasing materials is an activity. Now, what will drive this activity? What will drive this activity? Right? What will drive the activity of purchasing materials? So, the driver for purchasing materials, as an example, would be the number of orders placed. So the more the number of orders, the more the cost of purchasing. The less the number of orders, the less the cost of purchasing, right? So for example, purchasing of materials as an activity, the cost drivers could be the number of orders placed or the number of items ordered because the number of items you order would influence the cost of your purchase. And every activity could have multiple cost drivers, right? So that's very, very important to note. So number one is what identify the activities and assign costs to those activities. Number two is identify the cost drivers. Number three, you compute a cost driver rate based on the cost driver units. You compute a cost driver rate based on the cost driver unit. Now, what is a cost driver rate? A cost driver rate. Let's use an example to illustrate this. Now, in our example around purchasing materials, we realize that the we realize that the cost driver is the number of orders placed. The number of orders placed. So. Here, if we are to calculate a cost driver rate, the cost driver rate could be the cost per purchase order. That's a typical example, the cost per purchase order. That's a typical example of the cost driver rate. So how much is your cost per each order? How much is your cost for every single order you make? How much is the cost? So 
That's what we mean by the cost driver rate, the cost driver rate. That's very, very important to understand. Very, very important to understand. That's what we call the cost driver rate, cost driver rate. So number one is what? Identify activities. Number two is identify the cost drivers. Number three, you compute, um, you compute a cost driver rate. You compute a cost driver rate. Very, very important. Very, very important. So in terms of calculation, you can calculate the cost driver rate as the cost pool divided by the cost driver, right? The cost pool divided by the cost driver. That's also a way you could look at it. Number four, then you, number four is allocate production cost to products by multiplying the cost driver rate by the volume of cost driver units consumed by the product. So you can allocate production cost to products because at the end of the day, that's what you want to do, right? You want to allocate production cost to products because in costing a product, you need to include what it took you to produce that product. You need to allocate that cost to the product. So allocate production cost to products by multiplying the cost driver rate by the volume of cost driver units consumed by the product. So number one, you identify the activities. Number two, you identify the cost, um, you identify the cost drivers. Number three, you compute a cost driver rate. Number four, you allocate production costs. Now, what are the benefits of ABC? What are the benefits of ABC? The benefits of activity-based costing are numerous. They are numerous, right? Um, number one, activity-based costing provides more detailed measures of costs than traditional cost allocation methods, right? So it's a more detailed approach to costing, I would say. It's a very more detailed approach to costing rather than the traditional location methods, right? It's more detailed because it goes through an elaborate process of identifying the activities and then assigning costs to those activities. That's very, very elaborate. And then based on that, you can allocate you know, production costs to products. Number two, activity-based costing can help marketing people by providing more accurate product costs as well. So it's, you know, one of the things that marketing people need when putting their product out there is they need to price their product properly. Now, in order to price your product, you need to understand how much it is costing you, how much it is costing you to price the product. To price the product, you need to understand how much is this thing costing me? How much is this thing costing me? So, what activity-based costing does is to give an, a more accurate product cost. It gives a more accurate product cost than traditional methods. So it helps marketing people. Number three, it helps make a decision about pricing and which unprofitable product the company should eliminate. So we already talked about pricing in our previous benefits that we mentioned. It also helps to make a decision about pricing because it gives you know, a certain level of accuracy when it comes to product costing. Number four, production also benefits because activity-based costing provides better information about the cost of each activity, right? So what does this even mean? What does this mean? One of the things activity-based costing does is that it helps an organization identify cost costing activities, right? Now, once you understand the things that drive costs, you are able to take steps to reduce costs, right? So for example, let me just use a typical example. Let's, let's say if you look at your personal income, right? And you believe that you are overspending month on month, you are spending on different kinds of things. One of the things 
you would typically do is to break down your costs or see the things that are driving your costs. In your own personal life, what are the things that are driving my costs? Is it that you eat out very often or yeah, let's say you are spending on unnecessary things. So once you are able to identify the cost course and activities or the cost drivers, then you are able to have a better handle on reducing production costs. Number five, it assists in cost control, right? Which we talked about. It's it assists in cost control. You can control costs because you understand the drivers of costs. Number six, activity-based costing provides more information about product costs than traditional method. Traditional method, but requires more record keeping. Right. So with activity-based costing, organizations gain more information about product costs. They gain more information about product costs um, than just traditional methods. They gain more information about product costs. So that's very, very important. Right. You want to understand the details of your costs. So you see, there are numerous benefits to activity-based costing, numerous benefits. Number seven, it also ensures greater coordination and teamwork amongst functional management accountants, production managers, marketing managers, and other non-accounting people. You know, to gain more information on costs, it means that you would have to interact or coordinate with other functional managers. Because when you look at how a particular cost is incurred, the drivers that contribute to that cost um, could come from different sections of the organization. And therefore, it ensures that to get the full scope or full information about your cost, um, it, allows, it, it allows that you coordinate and interact with other functional managers, production managers, marketing managers, and even other non-accounting people um, in order to establish more information or sound information on your costs. <clears throat> now, what are the limitations? Obviously, there are numerous benefits to this. There are numerous benefits to this, but what are the limitations of activity-based costing? What are the limitations of activity-based costing? What are the limitations of activity-based costing? Number one, it is difficult to trace cost objectively to the production or delivery of a good or service. Since some costs are period costs and not so objectively traceable to an activity, sometimes you would find that it is difficult to trace a cost objectively to the production of a good or service, right? Um, so sometimes it can be difficult because the idea of ABC is that you trace costs to a product or to production, right? So, um, Sometimes it's difficult to do that because so because some costs are period costs. They are just period costs. And what are period costs? Period costs are simply costs that are not directly tied to the production process. They are not directly tied to the production process. So if you want to understand how a product is made, there are things that are directly tied or linked to the product. And there are things that are indirectly tied to the product. Period costs are not directly tied to the production process. They are not directly tied to the production process. Please remember this. Um, so a typical example of a period cost would be overhead. Overhead, right? They are not directly tied to the production process of a product. Sales, general, and admin expenses can sometimes are also period costs. Are also period costs. So sometimes it's difficult to trace cost objectively to the production or delivery of a good or service. 
Number two is it also does not consider potential conflicts, especially where there are more than one cost drivers. So sometimes there will be multiple cost drivers. And when there are multiple cost drivers, it creates you know, a scene for potential conflicts. The question here will be which activity drives cost then? Yes, there are multiple activities. So the next question would be, you know, what is the contribution of each of the activities to the costs? You know, and that's a, a very, very hard question to, to answer sometimes. It's a hard question to answer. So those are some of the limitations. Number three, activity-based costing regimes can be complex and expensive can be a complex and expensive system to operate. It's not cheap. Activity-based costing isn't cheap. It can be expensive. Um, it can be expensive and complex to operate. Since functional managers will have to profile activity, cost them objectively, and remove non-value adding activities, this can be can cumbersome to do. You know. Because it's a very expensive system. So, and it involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of work. So that's one limitation of ABC. Number four, the allocation of indirect costs is at least somewhat arbitrary, even using sophisticated accounting methods. So if you have um, an indirect cost, you know. Allocation of this indirect cost to products is arbitrary. It's arbitrary. It's arbitrary. So um, that's also a challenge. That's also a challenge with, um, with um, ABC as a costing method. Now, when we say it's arbitrary, it's based on personal choice. It's based on um, it's based on personal choice or a random choice because it's an indirect cost. It's an indirect cost, not a direct cost. If it's a direct cost, you can link it directly to the product. But an indirect cost, you can't. So the allocation of indirect costs is at least somewhat arbitrary. So let's look at, these are some questions that you can, you know, you can try to answer in your free time. Distinguish between traditional costing method and activity-based costing method. What is the difference between traditional costing method and activity-based costing method? Number two, identify and explain five steps in ABC. How do we improve ABC in practice? How do we improve ABC in practice? You know, so in terms of distinguishing between ABC and traditional costing method, one of the things you need to know with traditional costing method, it's more simplistic and less accurate compared to activity-based costing. Right? It's more simplistic and less accurate compared to activity-based costing. Right? But for Activity-based costing is more complex, but also more accurate compared to traditional costing methods. Number two, we talked about identifying and explaining five steps in ABC. We discussed that from identifying the activities to the last step, which is allocating production costs. Um, how do we improve ABC in practice? Improve ABC in practice by gaining more information about costs and what drives it, you know? So these are some questions you can think about in your spare time um, as you, you know, as you, as you watch this lecture or after you watch this lecture, sorry. So improving activity-based costing, how do you improve activity-based costing? How do you improve activity-based costing? So this question, this um, lecture is going to answer how do we improve ABC in practice? Okay, so number one, managers should use benchmarking and quality control to reduce the cost of activity. Managers should use benchmarking and quality control to reduce the cost of activities. So that's uh, one way of improving activity-based costing. 
you know, if you use quality control, ensuring that, you know, there's a solid quali quality control system in the organization, it helps reduce the cost of activities. Because if there's a good quality control system in place, it reduces the amount of reworks. So let's say you, you are into producing cars, right? And there's no quality control system. What will happen is that the car would be produced and you realize that, oh, it does not meet the necessary quality criteria. And then you will have to redo it again. And that comes with an additional cost. So managers should use benchmarking and quality control to reduce cost of activity. So quality control, in essence, helps to reduce the cost of activities. Number two, use what we call the just-in-time model, the just-in-time model to substantially reduce or eliminate the need for inventories and improve quality. So I'm sure you've heard of um, the JIT system, which is just-in-time, just-in-time system. So <clears throat> let's, let's explain, let's unpack the just-in-time model a little, a little bit. So, the just-in-time model is simply an inventory strategy where materials are only ordered and received as they are needed in the production process. So there's no stocking of inventory in the warehouse, right? This is a, this is a very, very interesting system where materials are only ordered and received as they are needed in the production process. So if materials are not needed, they are not ordered. So the goal of this method is to reduce costs by saving money on overhead inventory expenses, right? So that's why we, that's why, that's why the name, we have the name just in time, right? You only order and receive goods as long as you need them in the production process. If you don't need them, you don't order. You don't order. And this helps to, um, reduce costs as well. So use the GIT model to substantially reduce or eliminate the need for inventory, for inventory, you know, because inventory is also cost. When inventory is sitting in your warehouse, you have to, you know, protect the inventory and that comes with additional costs. Number three, improving activity-based costing. You identify quality problems using control charts. Pareto diagrams and cause and effect analysis, cause and effect analysis. Now, these are very sophisticated methods of identifying, um, identifying quality problems, right? Identifying quality problems. So what are control charts? I'll take each of them one by one. The, a control chart is a graph used to study how a process changes over time, right? A process change. So it's used to understand process behavior. Now, for you to identify quality prob problems, you need to unpack the processes, the processes that contribute to the production of a product, right? So the control chart helps you to understand how a process changes over time or the behavior of processes. Now, let's look at the, what we call the Pareto diagram. I'm sure if you're an economic student, you would have heard about Pareto. Pareto. So, so a Pareto diagram, a Pareto diagram is simply, is, is, is basically a simple, um, it's basically a simple chart. It's a simple chart. Um, which allows the user to identify areas to focus on first when it comes to process improvements. It's a simple chart that allows the user to focus on, to, to identify areas to focus on first when it comes to process improvement, right? So we are talking about quality problems here. So why are all these, methods focusing on process because it's the process that would likely influence the quality outcome if the process is bad the quality is most likely going to be bad 
right? So the priority Pareto diagram is a chart that is used to identify areas to focus on first in process improvement. They also have what we call cause and effect analysis. Cause and effect analysis. Now, this is somewhat self explanatory. This is somewhat self explanatory. Um, a cause. A cause and effect diagram is simply is a basically a visual tool which is used to logically organize possible causes for a specific problem or effect by displaying them in a very, very detailed manner. So it's, it's basically a, a chart or a diagram or a visual tool which basically organizes possible causes for a specific problem possible causes for a specific problem. So that's a, a cause and effect analysis. So you identify quality problems using these three mechanisms, control charts, Pareto diagrams, cause and effect analysis. And that helps to improve activity-based costing as well. Now, let's look at this question. Let's look at this question. A company manufactures two products, L and M, using the same equipment and similar processes. An extract of the production data for these products in one period is shown below. Products. So you have product L, product M. The quantity produced for L and M respectively is 5,000 and 7,000. Direct labor hours per unit, one and two respectively. Machine hours per unit, three and one respectively. Setup cost in the period 10 and 40 respectively. Orders handled in the period 15 and 60 respectively. So this is the question we have, right? Overhead costs um, relating to machine activity, 220,000. Relating to production run setup, 20,000. Handling of orders, 45,000. So you have 285,000 in total. So, so this is the question. In case you want to, um, in case you want to try out the question, in case you want to try out the question, you can uh, just pause it for a second and then you can have a look at the question again. You can have a look at the question again. So let me go up. Let me go up so that you can have a look at the question again. So this is a typical simple example of ABC, of ABC. This is a typical simple example of ABC. You are given a product and its details, the quantities produced there and the resources that are used to produce them, labor, machine, etc. Labor, machine, etc. So let's go to what the question is requiring us to do now. So required, right? The question says required. Calculate the production overheads to be absorbed by one unit of each product, each of the products using the following custom methods. Number one, a traditional approach using a direct labor hours rate to absorb overheads. Number two, an, an activity-based costing approach using a suitable cost driver to trace overheads to products. Now, this question is saying that let's use two different approaches. Number one is traditional approach. Number two is activity-based costing approach. So we'll see the difference as we, as we go along. As we go along. So first of all, when calculating using, so we are going to use the traditional costing approach. We are going to use the traditional costing approach. Now, we are told that there are two products, L and M, right? L has 5,000 units produced in terms of quantity. M has 7,000 units produced in terms of quantity, right? We are also told that, we are also told that it takes one hour to produce each unit, right? For L, it takes one hour. For M, it takes two hours. Now, how do we know that? 
if you go back to the question, if you go back to the question up here, you would realize that, you see, it takes one hour, the direct labor hours per unit, the direct labor hours per unit. It takes one hour to produce L, it takes two hours to produce M. So if you want to know the total number of hours to produce 5,000 units of L and 7,000 units of M respectively, then it will be one times 5,000 for L, two times 7,000 for M. So that's what we see with a traditional, the traditional approach, the traditional approach. So you see we have 5,000 units for L times one, 7,000 units for M times two. So hours required for L will be 5,000, hours required for M will be 14,000. The total labor hours would therefore be 19,000, 19,000. Very, very simple, right? Then you have what we call the overhead absorption rate. The overhead absorption rates. The overhead absorption rate. I'm sure you might have heard of this before. People usually call it OER. 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 You know, so what is the overhead absorption rate? The overhead absorption rate or the overhead absorption in a general sense is the amount of indirect costs assigned to cost object, objects, right? The amount of indirect costs assigned to cost objects. So the overhead absorption rates is simply overhead expenses over or divided by the quantity or value. So if you are looking at, for example, fixed absorbed overhead rates, it will be fixed overheads divided by outputs. You know, that's an example. But let's use the example here to illustrate this. So overhead absorption rate here is factory costs divided by labor hours. Factory cost divided by labor hours. Now, now let's go back to the question to, to see you know, why we are seeing factory cost divided by labor hours. Factory cost divided by labor hours. Let's, let's, let's go back to the question to see. Now, this is the overhead cost, right? We are told this is the overhead cost, which is the total factory cost. We are calculating overhead absorption rates. Now, when you hear rates, you should know that it's one thing divided by another. One thing divided by another. So if you hear overhead rate, absorption rate, it's overhead divided by something. You know, overhead divided by quantity or a certain value, right? So you have total overhead cost here. One relates to machine activity, the other relates to production runs. That, that relates to orders. And the total comes to 285,000, 285,000. That's what we see here, right? So we figured out the total production costs, sorry, the total factory cost side, right? So you have the factory cost here, right? But we should know that this factory cost is driven by labor hours is driven by labor hours. Now, why are we using labor hours, right? We said that the overhead absorption rate is simply the overhead ex expenses divided by a certain output or even machine hours or even labor hours. And that's why I use the general term, a quantity or a value, right? Quantity or a value. You see, so we need to understand how the overhead is being absorbed. Here we are told that a traditional approach using a direct labor hours rate to absorb overheads. So what does that mean? It will mean that our overhead absorption rate will be total factory cost divided by labor hours, divided by labor hours. So divided by labor hours, that's very, very important. That's very, very important. So, so what would this mean? 
well, what will this mean, right? It will mean that we divide the total factory cost by the direct labor hours, by the direct labor hours. Now, how do we come about the direct labor hours? Remember that we calculated it. We calculated the labor hours when we multiplied 5,000 by one and 7,000 by two for L and M respectively, we came to a total of 19,000. Now, if you divide the 285,000 by the 19,000, that's when we get 15. So the overhead absorption rate will be 15 Ghana cities. Will be 15 Ghana cities. Now, after this, you allocate the overheads to the product. Remember, remember um, the steps we talk up, talked about. We allocate the overheads to the product. So it takes one hour to produce a product for L. So you multiply 15 CDs, which is the overhead absorption rate by the hour. Then you have 15 Ghana CDs per unit. For M, it takes two hours. So you multiply the overhead absorption rate by that. And you get 30 CDs per unit. 30 CDs per, per unit. So for L, it's 15 CDs per unit. For M, it's 30 CDs per unit. One hour here refers to the direct labor hours per each unit. Two hours here refers to, it takes two hours of time for each labor to produce a unit of a product. So two hours, one hour. So you multiply one hour by 15, two hours by 15, you should get 15 CDs and 30 CDs respectively. Now we are given a hint here. The traditional costing method techniques allocate overheads to products on the basis of direct labor hours. Whereas the modern technique allocates overheads to products using machine hours or any acceptable cost driver, right? And, and why is this? Why this difference though? Remember that traditional costing methods are an older version of costing. So in the olden days, things were more labor intensive, right? Things were more labor intensive. So if you have to produce a machine, you need human beings to do that. But to these days, machines are doing that and abc or activity based costing which is a more modern technique would allocate overheads to products using machine hours it's likely to use machine hours compared to labor hours right because it's more modern these days machines do a lot of things it's you use ma machine hours or any acceptable cost driver any acceptable cost driver Now, total overhead cost for products. So if you take product L and product M, remember we said the quantity produced for product L is 5,000. It's 5,000. So if you multiply that, that by the overhead absorption rate of 15, then you get 75,000, right? For product M is 7,000. If you multiply that by the, if you multiply that by the rate we calculated per unit, it's 30. So that will be 210,000. Remember we calculated these rates, um, 15 CDs per unit and 30 CDs per unit. All right, so you have, 75,000 and 210,000 respectively. Very, very straightforward. Very, very straightforward. Very, very straightforward. Now, with the activity-based costing approach, with the activity-based costing approach, here, we are using machine hours. We are using machine hours, not labor. So that's the 
one difference that you can see. Here. Now, if you multiply the 5,000 by three, because it takes three machine hours to produce a unit of a product, um, you get 15,000 for L. And for my, um, M, it takes one hour to produce a unit. So that would be 7,000. So the total machine hours here will be 22,000. Be 22,000. Now, what will be the overhead absorption rate? The overhead absorption rate would be 285,000. The 285,000 we have here is the total factory cost. If you divide that by the machine hours, I told you the rate is always one thing divided by another. And here we are using machine hours as a driver of the cost. So if you divide 285,000, which is the total factory cost by 22,000, you should get 12.9 Ghana cities, right? Now let's look at the cost driver rates based on a activity-based costing. Remember the steps that I mentioned. One of the things is to determine the cost driver rate. So machine hour driven would be 220,000 divided by 22,000 hours, right? Now, how come, how are we getting this 220,000? Now, if you go back to the question, let's go back to the question. If you go back to the question, you, if you go back to the question, you'd realize that, you'd realize that you see you see that overhead cost is broken down into machine activity, production run setup, and handling of orders. So machine activity, 220,000, production run setup, 20,000, handling of orders, 45,000. And that's what we have here. And that's what we have here. And that's what we have here. So machine hour driven, you see for machines, 220,000. So we divide the 220,000 by 22,000 hours, by 22,000 hours, which we calculated. And then we get 10. The setup driven costs 20,000, 20,000, right? Then you divide by 50 setups. 50 setups. Again, how are we getting these 50 setups? How are we getting these 50 setups? Let's go back to the question. So let me show you exactly how we get the 50 setups, the 50 setups. It's a very straightforward way um, calculation, but um, can sometimes be confusing if you don't know exactly what you're doing, if you don't know exactly what you're doing. So, we have 50 setups, right? 50 setups. <clears throat> now, to get the 50 setups, to get the 50 setups, let's look at, let's look at how this is calculated. Let's look at how this is calculated. We are told here, we are told here that you, we are told here that if you go down a bit, we are told here that we have 20,000, which is coming from the breakdown of the total factory cost divided by 50 setups, 50 setups, 50 setups, right? 50 setups. So if you go back to the question, you, you should see, you should see that, um, you should see that 50, setups, um, just one second. So you have, you have um, setup cost in the period 10 and then 40, 10 and then 40. So if you add the 10 and 40 for L and M, that should give you 50. That should give you 50. That should give you 50, right? So that's where the 50 is coming from. That's where the 50 is coming from. Now, if you go to, 
handling of orders as well. You add the 15 to the 60, you get 75. So you divide 20,000 here, which relates to production run setups down here, which is 20,000 by 50. You divide 45,000, which relates to handling of orders by 75 here, 75 here. It's very, very um, simple approach. Very, very simple approach. So with that, you would, you would be getting these values. you will be getting these values down here. You have 220,000. You have 220,000 divided by 22,000 hours. 20,000 divided by 50. 45,000 divided by 75. So you get 10 CDs, 40 CDs, and 600 CDs respectively. So that's how you come about your cost driver rates. That's how you come about your cost driver rates. Now, you, after you get your cost driver rate, then you can go ahead to calculate your total overhead costs. Now for L and M respectively, we'll take each of them, which is machine, machine. You know, for machine, you calculate it this way. Right, you calculate it this way. You have 15,000 times 10, 15,000 times 10. Now remember that this 10 is our machine hour driven, machine hour driven. So where are, where are we getting the 15,000 from? Where are we getting this 15,000 from? We are getting this 15,000. If you go back to the question, if you go back to the question, you would see that, um, if you go back to the question, you would see, you would see, you would see that this 15,000, this 15,000 is coming from, if you drill down to the question. So you see, it's, it's a very systematic, way of you know it's a very systematic way of allocating costs which i'm sure you would have realized by now which i'm sure you'd have realized by now so for fifteen thousand, you get the fifteen thousand from the machine hours remember we are using machine hours to calculate everything here so we have Five thousand units, which is the quantity produced, times three hours, which is the time it takes to produce, gives us fifteen thousand. For M, seven thousand times one hour, which is equal to seven thousand. So if you come down, you'll see that um, for machine M, you have fifteen thousand hours times ten. Fifteen thousand machine hours times 10. 10 is simply, if you go back to, is the machine hour driven, that's 10. We already explained how to come by that. Then for M, you have 7,000 machine hours times the machine hour driven, which is 10. We have 150,000 for L, 70,000 for M. In terms of setup costs, setup costs, you have, um, 400, the setup cost driven, which you see here, setup cost driven is 400, right? For machine L, the setup cost was 10. And that's why can we see 10 here. So 10 times 400 is 4,000. For machine L it was 40, so 40 times 400 is 16,000. Orders handled for machine L, it was 15. And order driven is 600, which we calculated. So it gives us 9,000. And then for machine M, you have 60, which is, which is the order handling cost times 600, which is the order driven 600 All right so 
if you do that and you do your calculations right, you would have 9,000 in terms of orders handled and for L and for M, you would have 36,000. Now, if you add all the costs for L, you should get 163,000. For M, you should get 122,000, right? So now you can go ahead to calculate the cost per unit for L and M. Now the total cost for L was 163,000. If you divide that by the quantity produced for L, which is 5,000, you get 32.6. For M, it was 122,000. If you divide that by 7,000, which is the quantity produced, you get 17.43, 17.43. Now, what is the conclusion here? What is the conclusion here? And I would work some examples on activity-based costing, hand-solved, so that you can clearly see the process. I'm going through the slides. That's why um, I'm just pointing you to the areas to look at. So we'll do work some examples. So conclusion, products absorbed an unfair amount of overhead costs using a direct labor hour, the traditional approach. Absorption using a direct labor hour absorption rate. So the absorption rate is 15 Ghana CDs per hour, whereas the overhead absorption rate using machine hours is just 12.9 per hour. So that's the first thing you should have noted. For the traditional method, it was 15 CDs per hour. For activity based costing, it was 12.9 CDs per hour. Based on the cost drivers for each activity, the resultant costs are fairer than the traditional method. So, so this is a typical example of how to go through activity-based costing, right? Typical example of how to go through activity-based costing and be able to understand how exactly it works, right? I'll, as I've already mentioned, our hands solve some questions and we go through step by step. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. And thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.